Hello, folks. I'm Murray Mandrick, political columnist for the Regional Leader Post and Saskatoon Star Phoenix. Welcome to Inside uh, the Marble Palace, or as we like to know it, otherwise know it, Groundhog Day, because everything seems to be the same. We still have uh, COVID is a big issue and growing, and we still have the same federal government that we had before. So joining Amy as usual to talk about this, Arthur White Crummy, uh, political uh, reporter for the Leader Post and Star Phoenix. Hi, Arthur. Hello, Murray. And our friend from Saskatoon, Phil Puxitani, uh, Phil Tank, who's <laughs> going to talk about both the election and uh, um, and COVID right now. And I'm actually kind of really interested in in Phil telling us what it was like to cover the PPCs the night of the election with Maxim Bernier in Saskatoon. But let's start with Arthur on those election results. Uh, nothing changed. But here's what I'm kind of interesting, interested in. It wasn't as close where we thought it would be in terms of what could possibly change, which in my mind was death in this, or death the <laughs> Mississippi, uh, well, I'll try that again. Uh, that's Nithi, Mississippi Churchill River, where Buckley Belanger was running as uh, uh, a uh, liberal instead of a new Democrat. And it, in the end, it wasn't all that close in either Louvain or uh, Saskatoon West. And we might get into a little bit more with Bill. How not close was it? Uh, and is there any explanation as to why these races kind of didn't pan out? Well, <clears throat> The one that still looked close as of the end of election night uh, was Saskatoon West. I mean, it was really running down to the wire there, and and we were genuinely uncertain at the time that we had to print our stories. Uh, but uh, the gap widened pretty significantly after the fact, and that was already a close riding in 2019. Uh, the Conservatives won it by more than 2,000 votes. Uh, so it's uh, still a, a pretty good hold for them, and obviously the NDP put a lot of resources into winning that riding. Uh, it, it, it was really their priority in Saskatoon. Their priority down here in Regina was obviously Regina Louvan. The other two campaigns here were just paper candidates for them almost. So uh, Louvan, though, they did make some progress. I mean, in 2019, that was a blowout. Uh, it, it, we thought it was going to be close then, but Warren Stiley won it by about 12 thousand votes for the conservatives it's really been tightened uh I, I don't recall the exact margin but it's 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 significantly less than that they at least halved the gap from what it was in 2019 so in some ways the ndp even though they didn't win a seat potentially have more springboards going into the next election which uh as you know could be uh any time at all uh clearly the parties are going to want a bit of a breather but uh there's no commitment that there's not going to be another snap election so uh, we'll see what happens there uh dmcr you're right you know murray uh i i find it easier to just call it dmcr thank you great idea <laughs> but uh i'll back in dmcr yeah up north that that is always the hardest one to call uh it, it's uh it, 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 it so much depends on turnout so much depends on how the vote split goes and i really thought that uh, you know buckley had a chance because uh last time we put together the ndp and the liberals you you were approaching the conservative vote you know if they're able to unite that behind buckley and if they're able to turn out the vote, then maybe they could knock off Gary Vidal. But it did not happen. Buckley really uh, did end up getting uh, trounced by the Conservatives. And uh, uh, I, I, I guess uh, it's 14 for 14 again. And, and that's really the main lesson of the campaign is really how poorly the Liberals did. Uh, it was even worse than in 2019 when they got about 11 percent of the provincial vote. This time they got 10 percent. Uh, weren't able to make any gains, even in Wastana, which should have been their best possibility. And we can get into what the premier uh, drew from that, because clearly well, the let's fact do that, that uh, let's do that because he, he he emerged from his cone of silence, and apparently he still does not like Justin Trudeau, and apparently he still is unhappy with the election campaign. But I think what's interesting is what he's what he's now saying, and why he's saying it now as opposed to saying it during the election campaign, because in rough terms, I think he's saying that uh, we could have used Ottawa's help uh, with the, the election campaign and didn't get it, and that's what they should have been doing in the past month. He didn't say that in 
uh, during the campaign and chose deliberately not to say that because I think we even kind of asked him a few times. Uh, certainly Trudeau did, did bait him. What was his explanation for not for coming out now and not uh, saying anything during the campaign? Because I truly didn't understand it. No, no. I, I, I don't think we've ever gotten a clear answer on that because, of course, he was extremely willing to do it in 2019. This time, as you mentioned, and as we've said before, he just weighed in when he was attacked on a few issues that came up during the campaign, like his COVID management. But um, no, I, I, all that he was able to say yesterday when asked, you know, why didn't you bring up these pressing issues during the campaign when people were really listening, he just said there was no functioning government at the time, which one is not really true because there still is a cabinet in place, like in a somewhat caretaker capacity, but they still have their responsibilities. And further, it, it's, it's not really about uh, you know, addressing your requests to the federal government. It's about addressing it to the voters and the parties. If Saskatchewan had real priorities, well, now is the time to, to, to have your voice heard and to make sure that the parties are including your priorities in their platform. Uh, put some pressure on them. That's what Premier Francois Legault does, and uh, he often gets results for uh, Quebec. So we can ask ourselves why Premier Scott Moe didn't do that. Uh, there's certainly some way, some things we can speculate on. I mean, did he think that it might not be helpful for, you know, Aaron O'Toole to have a Saskatchewan premier weighing in while he was trying to win seats in the Toronto and, you know, Montreal areas? Only speculation, but uh, I've heard some uh, noted political scientists uh, speculating as much. Exactly. <laughs> and I think that's interesting uh, because I think it all comes down to where that PP sea boat would have gone and did go on uh, election night it was interesting that we lost uh, the uh, in saskatchewan the conservatives lost roughly the same amount of uh, vote as the ppc gained that's not necessarily the complete story elsewhere but phil you were there on election night with uh, uh the ppcs they seemed rather exuberant uh on on election night i'm more curious about one thing what are they most exuberant about that Trudeau didn't get his majority or that uh, Aaron O'Toole didn't get a minority or a majority? Because that seemed to be the dual agenda of, uh, of the PPCs this campaign. What were they saying on election night and what was the general mood? Well, yeah, it uh, it's interesting. It, it felt more like a victory celebration, even though they couldn't actually say we won this many seats. Obviously, they drastically improved their um you know, their vote share, uh, the number of votes they got. Um, I think they finished in second in one Saskatchewan riding and third in three or four more. So uh, clearly they're, uh, they're a force there. But none of that was mentioned in terms of, you know, here we are in Saskatchewan, here's how well our candidates did, possibly because, you know, they all finished in fourth place in Saskatoon ridings, you know, got more votes than they got the last time. I think they got about 6,000 votes this time. But um, it was, yeah, it was kind of a victory speech. It wasn't, the, I don't think either Trudeau or, or O'Toole was mentioned. Uh, Maxime Bernier tried, you know, called it his party the only real opposition party because they're all sort of in favor of uh, some sort of uh, measures on the pandemic, acknowledging the pandemic is real. And what was interesting in terms of the setup was they had, you know, they had an outdoor setup and an indoor setup. Now they, you know, spent a fair amount of money to have a stage and sound system and everything outside, but it became clear by about 8 p.m. that they were going to move everything inside. And of course, I'm sure everyone saw the videos of them without masks. And uh, there's been criticism of the Saskatoon police for not going in right away and and um, and uh, stopping the event. The police say they take a measure, you know, a quote measured approach to this uh, to ensure public safety. I don't know what it would have looked like had the police raided and said you have to shut down or or you know we're going to give everyone in here tickets as they leave. You know, I'm not suggesting it would have necessarily been violent, but uh, you know, who knows what would have happened. Uh, it was I, a very I, odd mood for. Uh, it for was still. That, and I'm very unclear as to why. Can you explain a little more what you heard that night as to why they moved from outside to inside? It was a lovely evening, uh, particularly for the PPCs, apparently, but they could have held it outside. And we never got much of an explanation watching it on TV as to why it was. Was there any clear explanation given then or is this just something they decided that they should do for whatever reason? I think, you know, I mean, obviously they oppose pandemic restrictions. So, uh you know, which is why it was in Saskatchewan, right? You could, yep. couldn't have, you had gathering restrictions in Quebec, you had gathering restrictions in, in Alberta, 
So where did they go? They went to Saskatchewan where there were no gathering restrictions. The only thing you had to do here was wear a mask indoors. And of course, that's what virtually everybody in the room did not do, uh, including Bernier when he came in. You know, you were allowed to not have a mask on while you're sitting and eating and drinking. Bernier is allowed to not have a mask on while he's speaking. Uh, but of course, that wasn't the case. He was mingling with the crowd. He took his mask off almost immediately. Virtually everyone was was maskless. And of course, there's a lot of uh, speculation about this becoming a super spreader event. It, it, it's, it's a little scary that a lot of these people may, may say, well, I don't want this to look like a super spreader event because we don't think the pandemic seriously. So how many of these people will get tested even they get even if they get symptoms? But to answer your question, we never got an explanation. Yep. Uh, the broadcasters were set up, out, up outside. Uh, there were huge, huge screens outside. And, you know, when I went in, inside just to check there, it was clear that's where people were gathering. That's where the bar was. That's where their free food was. So, I mean, I think they might have envisioned earlier of a thing where people go in, inside, uh, eat and drink responsibly, and then move back outside for the rally. That just is not what happened. And, that, and that's and that's not what happened. Let's talk about not necessarily this is a super spreader event, although your point is well taken. It could very well be. And I actually like, I'm interested in your point of why it might not be simply because people not getting tested. Uh, we might just see an influx in cases uh, down the road for various reasons in uh, Saskatoon. But Saskatoon remains probably the hot spot if I'm looking at the numbers for the Delta uh, variant fourth wave increase. Although the North, where uh, you follow quite closely, is, is hugely troubling. What's going on out there right now with cases and why is it so much worse now than it was at other stages in, in, in the pandemic? And I'm not so sure that people fully grasp how much worse it seems to be getting each and every week uh, uh, as we update these, uh, these numbers through this podcast. Yeah, and one of the things I'm noting in my column later this week is while these people were going maskless at this uh, at this PPC event, you had 105 people in hospital in Saskatoon with COVID-19, uh, the, the highest at any point in the pandemic, uh, 24 in the ICU, uh, which is also the highest. Um, yeah, our numbers have just been, you know, they're kind of like what, uh, actually they're higher than Re Regina's were earlier in uh, this year when, when the province did impose very severe restrictions. I mean, the mask mandate was already in place, but I believe they closed restaurants and bars and did all sorts of things. You know, here, I mean, I think you could say uh, it's a lack of uh, restrictions. I mean, it's difficult not to connect this to the lack of restrictions, right? And as far as up north goes, you know, that's still the worst outbreak in Canada by a wide margin, you know? I mean, I know it's sparsely populated and you can't say it's like an urban area and that, but for a sparsely populated area to have had the... Um, the uh, number of cases per capita that they've had for so long, it's nearly twice as much as the second highest, which is a little strip across the province, including Prince Albert. And, and you know, it, I'd like to point out that in July, the medical health officers asked for travel restrictions, a vaccine passport and masks, and they didn't get it until the province got masks and, uh, and vaccine uh, passports uh, last week. I, I want to bring Arthur back in because this speaks directly to what Premier Mo was talking about his concerns related to Ottawa not helping uh, enough in terms of dealing with the northern problem, uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of getting vaccinations out to people, and uh, he also said something rather interesting, at least to my ears, about healthcare workers and what they should be doing in terms of increasing uh, communication on social media. Can, can you speak to those two things? What was he saying and what do you think he is asking related to federal government help with uh, uh, the North and vaccinations or what can they do? And what is he also saying to healthcare workers uh, that he didn't actually speak much of or congratulate much? I noticed during uh, his, uh, his, his uh, last two appearances, but he does want them to do something. Let, let's start with the North and what it is that he wants them to do or possibly what they can do, given the fact that distribution of vaccines is still a provincial responsibility. Well, I mean, he noted the low vaccination rates in some remote northern communities. And of course, there is federal jurisdiction for on reserve vaccination. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, this is something that we need to dig into a little bit more deeper to figure out exactly uh, to what extent 
different levels of government have dropped the ball on this. Uh, I just viewed it as one of a long list of concerns and issues that the premier brought up that he believes the election sucked oxygen away from in an unhelpful way. Um, I know the NDP was a little bit upset about it because they viewed it as casting aspersions on Northern Saskatchewan when the province also has a fair share of responsibility for what's going on up there. But to me, it was really just one of a long list of issues that the Premier was bringing up in order to attack the election campaign and the decision to call an election, which he viewed as a distraction and a waste and a pointless exercise. I noticed that a lot of healthcare workers, both online and that I was talking to personally, were quite offended actually with the notion that the Premier was suggesting it to their ears that they weren't speaking up enough. I think they've certainly spoke up enough online. Uh, and I'm certainly, but I talked to them personally about uh, what's going on with COVID. They're not shy about uh, saying uh, uh, what the situation is. Arthur, what was he messaging there as Premier to those people? And did he want something sincerely out of them that they're not delivering? Or, it, or is this all part of the ongoing dialogue in which uh, the Premier has basically talked about uh, others doing more of their part and, and, and in a way maybe that deflects somewhat from the fact that the provincial government record right now isn't very good and the cases are are increasing. Well, I, I, I would presume, Murray, that the message was not directed to the physicians that you're thinking of, uh, those, for instance, that are very active on social media. I'm sure the Premier would prefer that, 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 that they maybe turn down the volume on some of their <laughs> relations and education work. Uh, but I mean, th th this isn't really a surprising thing to hear from the Premier. I mean, I, 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 I understand why health workers might be offended by that. But throughout this pandemic, I mean, the focus of the provincial government has really been on education and you know messaging uh, about the value of vaccines to the exclusion of public health restriction. Now we have both obviously, but it, 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 it was a strange way of phrasing it, but I wasn't really surprised to hear it come up. Phil, you followed this very closely in this specific way uh, of the COVID messaging not getting out or being not accepted in, as it was in the case in the PPCs. But I'm kind of curious from what you've observed, why it wasn't a bigger issue during the election campaign in Saskatchewan when the cases were so high, particularly in Saskatoon, where uh, they seem to be almost peaking at the time of the vote. Uh, and that of course is obviously very frightening. Why did it sort of not register in a, in a way that uh, that would come across maybe as a bit of a protest vote to uh, the provincial government as we might have seen in some ways more in Alberta or elsewhere. Uh, I certainly don't uh, see evidence that, uh, that there was much COVID talk during the campaign throughout Saskatchewan and certainly through your cities. Was that your observation as well? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, my, my colleague, Zach uh, Vachera, uh, had trouble getting uh, the conservative candidates to uh, reveal what their vaccination status was, and uh, eventually, uh, eventually they came through. But I mean, I think there was concern about losing votes to the PPC, who you know are certainly willing to provide a home for anyone who uh, is skeptical about the pandemic, vaccines, uh, restrictions, uh, anything else. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's. Uh, it's interesting. I, I look. I look back in the uh, history books. Well, actually, Google. But um, it, this is the first time since the '60s that uh, conservatives have swept Saskatchewan both times in uh, liberal minority governments. So, like, you know, they vote. It's kind of a contrary. Well, we know it's a contrary in province, right? A lot of the time, right? They like to have the opposition there. So uh, I thought that was interesting too. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think there was. I don't know why the other candidates didn't make. Uh, more of it uh, in terms of, I think the NDP and the uh, Liberals might have uh, gained a little more traction, but I, it was a very strange election. Obviously, during a pandemic, uh, there didn't seem to be, you know, you don't, you don't have rallies. You know, if you believe in the pandemic, right, you're not going to stage something where you, you know, bring a lot of people together. 
And uh, I think we're finding out that that's where uh, a lot of the messaging comes from. That's where a lot of the uh, momentum can come from an election. So it's it's kind of a catch-22. You're concerned about the pandemic, but you want to make sure you get your message across safely. And sometimes that's just not as effective. Yeah, and, and very difficult. Uh, quickly before we go, I guess, from both of you, uh, what can we sort of expect next in terms of of this now that the election is over uh is it possible that we might see uh the premier uh add to uh his stance of uh, last uh thursday friday and more restrictions uh, is there is there some hint in that regard arthur i didn't get much from him yesterday um uh in terms of him talking about any more added restrictions notwithstanding our numbers did you i did not uh, and, and and I, based on past experience of the way that these, you know, restrictions generally work out, they like to sort of take some time to see uh, how, uh, what the effect is after about a two, two or three week period. So given that some of them are only really coming into effect uh, uh, during the present, I mean, I, I think that we're going to have to wait and see. And uh, if, if things continue to get out of hand, then... We're going to ask those questions. And, and Phil, uh, given what Arthur said, and I, I think he's right, we're, we're just now going to see some of the the, the added results from uh, uh, the changes. But what are doctors and others saying in terms of what we might expect uh, next in terms of either numbers or uh, the reality, especially for, uh, for Saskatoon, where we have the twofold problem of uh, – the ICU and hospitals filling up and the added cases uh, skyrocketing in that in that city and north uh, that where uh, Saskatoon provides obviously the bulk of the metal, medical care. What is their concern uh, if uh, if what is happening right now, if the added measures don't work? Well, it's, I think it's very similar to the concerns that you had in Regina in March that, you know, ICUs are becoming overburdened. Um, I think we, all we've heard from, in, you know, Dr. Livingstone, the head of the uh, the CEO of the SHA, has said expect this to get worse. You know, like our modeling shows that, you know, there's a lay, and you know, the hospitalizations we're seeing now always lag behind the cases, right? So when we're seeing the number of cases we get, we're getting right now, you know, we can expect the hospitalizations, to, you know, to get to to grow higher as well. I mean, I know there was a lot of speculation that Mo was waiting until after the federal election because he didn't want to become an election issue much. Uh, but of course, he was on the final weekend. Uh, 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 the Prime Minister Trudeau was saying the same, you know, lumping him in with Jason Kenney uh, as, um, you know, here's an example of where we're going to go with Aaron O'Toole, whether that had an effect on what the way people voted or not, who knows. Um, if you remember last November, December, it, I think in, in a span of like a month and a half, the province imposed um, seven different layers of, of restrictions. So they tend to sort of say, oh, okay, we're going to do this and then we're going to do this. I mean, this week will be interesting. Are they going to do something more or are they, like Arthur suggests, uh, going to wait and see whether these are having an effect? They certainly don't seem to be so far. I mean, I know, you know, we had a low case rate number of cases uh, Yesterday, but I mean, we also had a re uh, on election day. We also had a really low um, vaccination uh, number. So yeah, it will. Uh, I, I unfortunately, and I hope it's not the case, but uh, all point, all signs point to you know the hospital crisis getting worse, and uh, I don't know how we we stop uh, the uh, the growth in cases. Nice to see thousands of people getting vaccinated. I believe this weekend, for the first time since May thirtieth, we had. First doses outnumber second doses, which is always a positive thing. So people are choo choosing to get out there and get their first doses. Yeah, yeah. putting restrictions where they have to get vaccinated, people get vaccinated. Who knew? Um, I thank you very much, guys. We seem to be running out of time. And boy, there's a lot to talk about and maybe even more next week. And, and I hope Phil's right. I hope that the, the, it slows down and, uh, and we all are able to stay safe out there. Phil, Arthur, thanks very much for your time. And we'll see you guys next time on Inside the Marble Palace. Thanks, Murray. Thanks for having me.